Following the full release of Subnautica Willow Zero on May 14th, 2021, the future of the Subnautica franchise has been somewhat uncertain. Unknown Worlds, the developer of both Subnautica games, has continued to update each game since that time, fixing bugs and improving the overall game experience for every platform. In fact, in a recent blog post on their website, Unknown Worlds announced their plans for Subnautica Below Zero 2.0, which will include performance optimization, bug fixes, and an enhanced game mode that will allow you to set custom conditions for your game. In the same blog post, they also announced their plans for Subnautica 2.0, which will also include performance and bug fixes in addition to bringing many of the quality of life improvements from Subnautica Below Zero to Subnautica, including recipe pinning, item bars, and some of the new base pieces, such as large rooms, that were introduced in Subnautica Below Zero. While this is great news for the community, since it shows that the developers have actually been listening to our suggestions, the question I think we've all been asking ever since Below Zero's full release is what new video game will Unknown Worlds be working on next? And thankfully, they've actually answered this question as of late. On the official Unknown Worlds website, several job postings have been created for the next game in the Subnautica universe, confirming that the devs are in fact working on another game. What exactly that game will be, however, has been rather confusing. You see, we've also known for some time now that Unknown Worlds has been working on some sort of new, genre-defining game. In their parent company Crafton's 2021 financial report, this new game was referred to as Project M, and was described as a turn-based strategy game set in a sci-fi world being developed for PC and mobile platforms, and set to release in early access later this year. On August 23rd, the game was revealed by the name of Moonbreaker, live at Gamescom opening night. It's very clear by the trailer that Moonbreaker is not the next underwater survival game in the Subnautica series that we were all hoping and expecting to be next. And so, there's been a lot of confusion as to whether Moonbreaker is the next game in the Subnautica universe promised by the new job postings, or if it's something completely separate. This exact question was posed by one Twitter user, under Unknown Worlds' announcement that they will be revealing their new turn-based strategy game at Gamescom. In response, Scott McDonald, one of the Subnautica developers, said that the next game in the Subnautica universe is also being worked on and that they have multiple teams. So, this clarifies that Moonbreaker is a completely separate game from Subnautica 3, both of which are being worked on by different teams. But with that in mind, what exactly do we know about Subnautica 3 so far? As of right now, it seems that Subnautica 3 is very early on in development, so we don't know very much about it. According to an interview with Subnautica Below Zero game director David Kalina, fans shouldn't expect Subnautica 3 anytime soon, as Moonbreaker is clearly being prioritized. That being said, there is a small team of about a dozen people who are doing concept discovery, or basically trying to figure out what Subnautica 3 will actually be. A lot of ideas are being explored, like an above-ground aerial game, a space game, and even a game set within the human body. There have also been hints that Subnautica 3 might be multiplayer, but nothing is set in stone just yet. Everything we've been given so far is basically speculation. And so, with Subnautica 3 being in the early stages of development, you have to wonder, when everything is fully fleshed out, what will Subnautica 3 be like? Where will it take place? What will be the premise of the game? Well, I've essentially created three very in-depth concepts for Subnautica 3 that I'll be sharing with you in today's video. So let's get right into it. My first idea for a third Subnautica game is heavily inspired by content I've seen throughout the community. Plenty of concepts for a Subnautica 3 suggest that it should take place in the depths of 4546B. So for this concept, I've compiled many of those concepts with my own ideas into a game I call Subnautica Crush Depth. Subnautica Crush Depth would be set a year after the events in Subnautica Below Zero. It would take place deep in the void, inside a massive underwater cave system. The huge contrast between deep sea environments like this one and environments that are relatively close to the surface like those seen in the Subnautica games would give Unknown Worlds the creative liberty to construct a brand new world, very different from those they've made previously, which is what I think they would want. You begin the game with a cutscene very similar to the one that starts off Subnautica. Fire can be heard blazing in the background as alarms sound and a male robotic voice says, Critical damage sustained. Whole failure imminent. Abandoned ship. The screen is black, but you can hear yourself running. You enter a small life pod alone, and as you eject, you look through the top hatch as a massive, clearly damaged submarine glides past you through dark, murky water. Loud creature roars can be heard, followed shortly by an explosion. As you continue to fall through the water, your life pod gives you updates as to what is happening. Its messages get worse and worse as its systems slowly start to fail until eventually it tells you through its female robotic voice, race for impact with the ocean floor. Then, everything goes black. When you wake up and exit the life pod, you find yourself in a small crevice surrounded on either side by vibrant caves, full of unique species of flora and fauna. All you have with you is the partially damaged escape pod that you can use to replenish your oxygen and fabricate supplies. The pod gets its power from nearby hydrothermal vents. 
Your only goal is to escape to the surface, and in order to do so, you begin to explore the area around you. At first, you're clueless as to who you are and why you're here in this deep sea cave, and you don't know why you can't remember anything. But through the various entries in your PDA, you learn that you were a member of an Altera research team sent to explore this deep sea cave system for an unknown reason. Although later on in the game's story, you learn that Altera had detected some sort of strange signals coming from the area, and sent you and your team to investigate. Due to the stressors of this environment, the biomes you would find would be completely different from those found on the surface of the planet. High pressure would lead to unusual fauna and the lack of light would eliminate any photosynthetic plants. This lack of sunlight would have an interesting effect on the visuals of the game, since biomes would need to be lit up through other means. Since the sun's energy doesn't reach this area, the ecosystem would rely on the massive amounts of volcanic activity in the region through a process known as chemosynthesis. This would create a food chain where the smallest organisms feed off of and live near hydrothermal vents, bigger organisms feed on them, and so on. Deep Sea Gigantism, which is defined as the tendency for species of deep sea dwelling creatures to be larger than their shallow water relatives, would have a massive impact on the region. Basically, creatures down here would be huge and terrifying. Just imagine creatures similar to the anglerfish and the other deep sea creatures I've shown on screen, but way bigger. It's quite frightening to think what unknown worlds could do with this phenomenon. Another thing that would be incredibly interesting to see in Subnautica Crush Depth is creatures with more unique bioluminescence. With no light from external sources, a lot of deep sea lifeforms have specialized parts of their body that emit light, which is how I imagine a lot of biomes would be lit up. Some creatures could have rippling colors along their body, dangling lures to draw in their prey, or could even expel glowing fluid for communication. Unknown worlds could create quite the dazzling light show with the flora and fauna in this game. As you can already guess, Subnautica Crush Depth would be much scarier than the first two Subnautica games. It would be a lot more atmospheric, have music and sounds designed to scare you, and use a lot more horror elements, like a massive buildup of tension until the end of the game. I think the scary side of Subnautica is one of the most appealing parts of the game, and if they were to focus on that, the game could be incredibly successful. Underwater horror games are some of the most popular horror games out there. It's something a whole lot of people want. Just take a look at games like Iron Lung. But in order to make the game scarier, the creature AI would have to be improved from how it is in the Subnautica games. They could implement some unique behaviors with a new fauna that would make them much more terrifying. Some creatures could be very aggressive and not just run away after taking damage. Some could stay a slight distance away and observe the player before attacking. And some could even lure the player into a jump scare to make resource gathering all the more tense. Anyways, using the resources from each biome, just like in Subnautica and Subnautica Below Zero, you were able to upgrade your tools and equipment as well as build submarines, including a massive deep sea submarine very similar to the Atlas submarine, which would allow you to explore the area further. Unlike the first two Subnautica games where the goal is to travel from the surface to the depths, the goal in Subnautica Crush Depth is to make it from the depths to the surface, where you can use a floating communications tower to call for help. That being said, the exit tunnel, which is the only entrance or exit to the cave system that will allow you to escape, is located near the bottom of the cave, so you'll need to travel deeper in order to make it to the surface. Now, as for why you can't just head to the surface the moment you get a submarine, well, there's a massive sleeping leviathan blocking the way out. In order to wake it up to clear the exit, you'll need to complete the game's main story. Speaking of the story, as you begin to explore further, you start to come across a couple of interesting things. The first thing you come across is the wreckage of other survivors from the submarine, just like yourself, similar to how it is in Subnautica. This would slowly build up the tension because, based on the wreckage and the voice logs, you'd know something killed them. Eventually, you'd also stumble across the wreckage of the submarine. There, you'd learn about the crew you were once with, that you were sent to this cave because of a signal coming from the area, and you'd also uncover the disaster log of when the ship was destroyed. You'd also discover architect technology in the area, including some destroyed architect equipment as well as several intact alien bases, where you learn what the architects were doing there. You'd learn that they'd also discovered some sort of signal coming from the area, and that they'd also sent teams to investigate. You'd learn of what they found and what ultimately happened to them. Upon tracing the signal, they uncovered an absolutely titanic creature. The creature's design is up to the imagination of unknown worlds, but I like to think that it would be similar to the gargantuan leviathan. The architects set up a bunch of equipment to study the creature, suspecting it might be intelligent and the origin of the signal, but were constantly attacked to the point where they had to abandon their research and leave. And as you continue to upgrade your equipment and explore further and deeper, you'd eventually encounter the same creature that attacked the architects, and that you can infer attacked your ship. It would be a colossal beast and would be positioned in the deepest part of the world, in the way of the tunnel that leads to the surface. You need to construct some sort of equipment to wake the creature, which would be your main goal. Once it awoke, you discover something incredible about the creature. The Leviathan is extremely intelligent. It's able to communicate with you and was the origin of the signal. However, unlike the Sea Emperor from Subnautica, the 
this Leviathan is not so friendly. Now that you've woken it up, it talks to you, mocking your size and how you will ultimately meet your demise despite trying so hard. How it had purposefully left you alive so you could struggle to survive only to be destroyed when you were so close. How it had toyed with your mind, causing you to lose your memory at the start of the game. Everything you went through was because of it. After talking to you in this manner for some time, it begins to twirl and twist around you, barely fitting through the massive caves that act as tunnels for it. It's toying with you, trying to terrify you as much as possible, and make the most out of you before it consumes you and your submarine in a single gulp. Utilizing this to your advantage, you make a mad break for the tunnel that leads to the surface, and begin the maddening ascent, navigating through the twists and turns. Your PDA guides you to travel on the fastest route to the surface, ignoring all the side tunnels that branch off, where the Leviathan continues to toy with you as you head to the surface. It's disappointed in this fact, as it had hoped that you'd get lost in the tunnels, so that it could make the most out of you before your death. The situation seems hopeless. Surely there's no way you can escape this. But what the creature doesn't know is that you've built another device, Ion Boosters, into your submarine using the alien technology you found in the alien bases and combining it with some of your own. If you can reach 1000 meters, the tunnel will straighten out just enough for you to boost straight to the surface and escape. As you approach this destination, the Leviathan seems to suspect you might have a chance to escape. It stops toying with you and swims up behind you, jaws about to clamp down. But at the last possible second, you turn the bend, activate the Ion Boosters, and escape to the surface. The Leviathan, being a deep sea creature and not accustomed to the sunlight, retreats back into the cave it came from, preparing to set another trap. And you, the player, utilize the emergency communications tower floating on the surface of the water to contact Altera. An escape shuttle comes, picks you up, and then finally, you are safe. I think this idea has massive potential. It's not as fleshed out as my next concept, but it's definitely interesting yet terrifying to think about. A lot of details would need to be worked out, biomes would need to be planned, it wouldn't exactly be easy. But with what Unknown Worlds has made in the past, I think it is very possible. Please tell me what you think about this concept in the comment section if you have any suggestions or think anything should be changed. But now, let's move on to my next idea. My next idea contains spoilers for the ending of Subnautica Below Zero, so if you'd like to avoid spoilers for the game, skip to the timestamp shown on screen. My second concept for a third Subnautica game takes place right after the events of Subnautica Below Zero. It would tie together all the loose ends and give the Subnautica trilogy a satisfying ending. I call it Subnautica Genesis. The game would start on the Architect homeworld, where Alan has discovered that the Architect race is in fact alive, although they are on the verge of collapse due to the impacts of the Kara bacterium. Trillions have died and Alan feels responsible for the catastrophe. Alan is brought before the leading council of architects to be tried for disobeying the directive from his network, which resulted in the Kara being let loose on 4546P and the failure of the architects to secure the Enzyme 42 cure. It is determined that in order to atone for his mistakes, Alan is to travel to the planet where the Kara came from. The planet is located very far from the architect homeworld in an extremely difficult spot of space to reach. The only external lifeforms that have ever set foot on the planet are the architects who initially discovered it and subsequently spread the Kara to the rest of their species. Since then, no one has stepped foot on the planet's surface in fear of being exposed to a more deadly, concentrated strain of the Kara. This is also due to the fact that the planet is inhabited by extremely dangerous creatures who have been infected and mutated by the bacterium, similar to those seen in the Natural Selection series. Recently, however, scans of the planet's surface performed by nearby Architect satellites have detected some sort of alien technology foreign to the Architects, and so it's Alan's job to travel to the planet in order to learn more about where the Kara came from in hopes that the information can be utilized to eradicate the disease. The scans reveal that there is only one location on the planet where the alien technology is still functioning. Alan is to travel there alone in a spaceship, explore the region, and relay whatever information he finds back to the Architects before he ultimately dies from the Kara. Essentially, this is a one-way trip, so that the Architects can get something useful out of a criminal no longer fit to live in their society. But hold on a second, you might be asking, why couldn't the Architects just use the Enzyme 42 cure discovered by Riley Robinson and used on a wide scale by Altera to cure themselves and their race? Well, that's the thing. The Architects did use Enzyme 42 to cure themselves after Alan and Robin brought the recipe with them to the Architect homeworld. But there's a problem. You see, when the cure was discovered, Altera spread it very thin throughout 4546B in an attempt to completely cure the planet. This allowed for a process known as antibacterial resistance. When the disease was exposed to the very small amounts of Enzyme 42 spread throughout the planet due to the Kara's adaptive nature, the bacteria that were most resistant to Enzyme 42 were able to survive and spread once again. Then, as these more resistant bacteria were exposed to slightly more Enzyme 42 as time went on, the process was repeated and the bacteria best suited to resisting the enzyme were able to remain and reproduce. 
This process continued until eventually a strain of the corral was created that was completely resistant to the enzyme 42 cure. Antibacterial resistance actually occurs in real life, it's actually a massive problem. So with the Kara's mutative properties combined with Altera's rash action, it's honestly very likely that this could occur. This enzyme 42 resistant Kara strain then began to once again spread throughout the architect race, and this time the human race as well. This is where Robin IU, Subnautica Below Zero's protagonist, comes in. You would once again play as her in this game, and although in Subnautica Below Zero the character didn't seem to have much motivation to follow the game's main storyline, this time around she would be motivated by the pressure to not only save her new friend, but to also save both of their races from certain extinction. And so, Robin joins Alan on his journey to the planet where the Kara came from, and together they land on its surface. The environment of the planet is very unique and alien to anything seen before on Earth or on 4546b. This would allow unknown worlds to create a new sci-fi world just like it seems they want to. For some unknown reason, which is later implied through the story, the atmosphere on the surface itself is mostly a purple color. Purplish mountain ranges are visible to the player at all times, but are unable to be explored. The water is tinted purple. Several small islands can be found above the surface of the water, but most of the map lies submerged. Alan and Robin land on one of these islands. Green pustules and veins course through the ground and Kara infected plants dot the surface. Alan and Robin exit the spaceship and look around them, knowing that they are some of the only foreign life forms to have ever touched the planet. Just by setting foot here, they are both aware that they've been infected by deadly strains of the Kara that are certain to eventually kill them. As Robin and Alan examine the environment around them, they are suddenly interrupted by a loud roar. A colossal creature leaps out of the water and grabs the spaceship in its jaws, shaking it several times before pulling it into the depths of the ocean. Robin narrowly misses being struck by the ship, but Alan, being much taller, is not as lucky. He is smashed into several pieces by the ship and knocked into the water, falling into the depths of the ocean along with much of what remains of the ship. Technology found in the wreckage of the ship is later used to create new tools and equipment. This leaves Robin with two main goals. Firstly, to find the pieces of Alan's body in order to revive him. Since all of his data is still being stored within each piece, if they can all be found and reunited, he can be fully restored. And secondly, to explore the alien technology that is supposedly somewhere within the area, in order to learn as much as possible about the disease, and then find a new way to transmit the data back to the architect since the ship was destroyed. Robin is left with several pieces of wreckage from the ship that function as her life pod. Inside is a working fabricator that is powered by solar panels or some sort of architect energy source. You, playing as Robin, begin to explore the environment around you. Under the water, everything isn't as purple, especially the deeper you go, although there is still plenty of Kara everywhere. There are tons of biomes and creatures that are all very unique, just like in both Subnautica games. Some of the biomes are home to massive leviathans, including the one that destroyed your ship, and the creatures get bigger as you descend into this new world's depths. The deepest biome reaches roughly 2,000 meters, making it one of the deepest accessible biomes ever seen. You explore these environments, crafting new equipment, tools, and submarines that help you to dive further, just like in the original Submarica games. As you travel deeper, you find pieces of Alan's body, as well as a number of alien bases. Inside these alien bases, you uncover the story of this planet and begin to understand the origins, or genesis, of the Kara, thus explaining the game's title. The first alien base you run into appears to have been some sort of ancient pump system. The base seems to be without power as the inside is dark and none of the equipment is functional. Massive pipes holding some sort of green substance can be found throughout the base. There is one enormous inflow pipe and there are several smaller outflow pipes, branching off into every direction. A quick scan of the green substance found within these pipes reveals that it is in fact the Kara. The disease is no longer flowing through the pipes, but at one point in the past it seems that it was. There is also plenty of equipment that appears to have been used to manage the pump, although it has since fallen into disrepair. The next alien base appears to have been some sort of massive factory. Just like the first, this alien base is without power and has fallen into disrepair. Inside, you can find massive factory equipment that appears to have been used to create the Kara, as evident by the bright green residue covering the equipment and the massive pipe full of Kara that seems to go to the pump alien base. The third alien base is a massive laboratory. Unlike the previous two alien bases, this one has power with functional lighting and working equipment, although you cannot interact with it. Tons of test tube-like cases with various colored blobs can be found inside along with loads of research equipment. There are also several data downloads that can be found here, providing the player with further information regarding the Kara, much more than we learn in Subnautica. The next alien base appears to power all the other alien bases in some way, similar to the alien thermal plant on 4546b. This base was designed to last indefinitely without upkeep, which is why all the other alien bases around the planet didn't appear to have power in the architect scan. Unfortunately, the process used by the alien base to produce power seems to release some sort of purple byproduct. 
This unwanted substance is then sent through a number of exhaust pipes to the surface of the ocean, where it is released into the environment in a gaseous form. This is implied to be the reason for the purple tint found throughout the region. Small alien bases can also be found on the outskirts of the explorable area, that each hold non-functioning cannons. Each weapon is nearly identical, hinting at a common purpose, and some sort of pipe can be seen entering each base. The fifth and final alien base is absolutely massive, located roughly 2,000 meters below the ocean surface and patrolled by several leviathans of the species that destroyed your ship. Inside, you discover that the base is essentially a massive library with enormous amounts of data regarding an alien race known as the Proelium. Now, Proelium directly translates to war or battle in Latin, and was the best thing I could come up with for the name of the aliens. The name is subject to change and more of a placeholder at the moment. You uncover more and more information as you travel deeper into the library, so you can only get the full picture if you explore all the library sections. As you collect new data on the Proelium, your PDA analyzes and translates the alien records, each one delving into the history of this mysterious race. The Proelium were an aggressive, warfaring species that lived on this planet ages ago. They were constantly fighting among themselves, leading to a power struggle that was immensely damaging to their planet. We learn a little bit about what they looked like, and that despite being very technologically advanced, they hadn't expanded beyond their homeworld due to the constant infighting. Man, somehow this seems familiar. The competition from the opposing sides in their wars led to extremely advanced weaponry being developed, including biological weapons. Eventually, this competition to create the better weapon led to the creation of the Kara Bacterium in the laboratory alien base you explored previously. And so, the Proelium nation that created the Kara utilized the deadly weapon on their enemies. They used the factory alien base to mass produce the Kara and the pump alien base to send it to the cannon alien bases, which then shot the Kara to whatever target they had in mind. Within the Kara's genome, the Proelium inserted a kill switch, which could be activated to nullify specific infections. This kill switch was also designed so that if the bacteria mutated to resist the kill switch, it would lose the ability to reproduce, killing it off before a new generation could be replicated. This secret kill switch couldn't be allowed to get into the hands of their enemies, otherwise the deadly weapon which was working wonders would become utterly useless. And so, the ability to use the kill switch was placed in the hands of the nation's two leaders. This system worked totally fine until they were both killed in a counterattack from one of the factions devastated by the disease. You see, they had greatly over estimated the safety of their leaders, considering them to be unkillable. They had kept them separate so that if one died, the other would still be in command. But the enemy saw through this tactic and mounted a double assault, successfully destabilizing the last line of defense against the Kara. The kill switch was impossible to hack, meaning that there was suddenly no way for anyone to control the disease. Not long after, it spread rapidly throughout the planet, killing billions of Proelium as well as many species of flora and fauna. As time went on, most of their race perished, and the remaining Proelium realized that their species was on the brink of extinction. In one final effort to preserve their race, they constructed a great library around the kill switch, immortalizing their story and giving anyone who set foot on the planet the chance to disable the Kara, if they could find a way to activate the kill switch. Since the library was constructed, all members of the Proelium race died, and the Kara slowly evolved into the DNA-modifying disease it is today. A handful of species were able to adapt to the Kara's presence, which explains the flora and fauna that can still be found on the planet. After you learn this, you explore further into the library, where you discover some sort of alien fabricator that can be used to reconstruct Alan. Further along, there is a control room where you can find the kill switch. Unfortunately, you are unable to activate the kill switch, but if Alan can be revived, perhaps his hyper-advanced architect knowledge would allow him to hack into the kill switch and activate it. Throughout all your time on the planet, the Kara has progressed through all its stages and is now slowly beginning to kill you, so you are desperate to find Alan's body in order to save yourself and your entire race. Eventually, you find all of the pieces of Alan's body and reconstruct him. Or, if you have already found all of the pieces, you can reconstruct him without having to leave. Alan thanks you, and after a little bit of explaining, is then able to hack into the kill switch and activate it. The Kara present in your body dies, shown in a cutscene similar to the one at the end of Subnautica. And throughout the galaxy, all of the Kara everywhere is killed. The kill switch also kills all of the Kara inside every single one of the other alien bases, permanently eradicating the disease for good. This leaves you with one thing to do. Construct a new architect spaceship in order to leave the planet and return to the architect homeworld. Alan asks you to help him find some of the materials needed to build the ship since you know the planet much better than he does. While you're finding the materials, you notice how different the planet looks now that all the Kara has been eliminated. Once you find all the resources, you meet Alan on one of the islands, he constructs the ship, and then you travel back to the architect homeworld where you are celebrated as heroes. 
That is the end of the main storyline, but in every Subnautica game there's also an optional side storyline that you don't have to do but adds more to the game. In this case, the optional storyline is similar to the Degasi storyline in Subnautica. Basically, you learn about what happened to the architects who discovered the planet, how many of them succumbed to the Korah, and how the few who survived accidentally spread it throughout the galaxy. I think that would be extremely interesting to learn about, and that's everything I have for this concept so far. Obviously, many details would need to be fleshed out. It's nowhere close to being perfect, but I think it's an outline that would seriously make an amazing game. There are a couple of problems, however. People who haven't played Subnautica and more so Subnautica Below Zero would be very confused about what was going on, so there might need to be a few tweaks to the beginning of the game or maybe some sort of PDA entries that fill in the information from the previous games. There's probably a couple of other problems I'm missing that I'm sure all of you will tell me about in the comment section. But now, let's move on to my final concept. My final idea for a third Subnautica game is honestly my least favorite of the three and isn't anywhere near as fleshed out as the previous two, but despite that, I still think it has potential and it's definitely interesting to think about. In a poll on Twitter posted by the co-founder of Unknown Worlds, Charlie Cleveland, on April 6th of this year, he asked what feature would excite people the most about the next game in the Subnautica universe. Of the four, well really three options, co-op was the most desired feature, followed pretty closely by new wildlife and biomes. Multiplayer Subnautica has been something people have wanted ever since Subnautica was released into early access. While there is a multiplayer mod for Subnautica, it's incredibly buggy since the game was designed to be single player. But if Unknown Worlds made a new Subnautica-like game that was designed to be multiplayer, I think a lot of people would like it. As the poll shows, new wildlife and biomes also seem to be a big appeal. The only problem with this is that Unknown Worlds seem to have used up most of their ideas for new biomes and creatures. Below Zero felt like it was meant more to be a DLC rather than an actual game. There just weren't as many new creatures and biomes and there was a lot of empty space. However, if Unknown Worlds made this new Subnautica game on a completely separate world from 4546B, then that would open the doors for a whole lot more creativity. The creatures, biomes, and plants would be completely unique to those found on 4546B, since they would have experienced a different evolutionary history. This would also satisfy their apparent desire to make their new game be set on a new planet. So in order to appease both the consumers and the developers, Subnautica New World would be multiplayer, but also have the ability to be played single player, and would be set on a new world other than 4546B with completely new biomes, flora, fauna, and story. You and your friends will be a part of an exploration team whose goal is to explore, map, learn, and catalog whatever new worlds they are assigned to. Yes, you heard that right, you would have a map that would fill in as you progress throughout the game. I was thinking the area you were able to explore would be much bigger than the Subnautica and Below Zero maps were, with loads of new, bigger biomes. Without a map, navigation could end up being a major hassle. Your team could be employed by Altera or one of the many other transgubs in the Subnautica universe. I think having a new transgub would be a better fit as it would switch things up and fit in with a new planet concept. Maybe the Soul transgub from the Mercury 2 story would be a good option. At the start of the game, you'd be dispatched on a water world with a massive submarine and some supplies. But you'd have to use the environment to upgrade the sub, build whatever new things you might need, acquire food and water, and much more. A sub could be similar to the Atlas submarine in that you'd need other people to pilot it, you could dock smaller vehicles, and maybe even dock larger submarines like the Cyclops. I'm not really sure what the story would be or even if there would have to be one. You could just be exploring, surviving the planet's threats, upgrading your submarine and equipment, and learning more about the planet. When you learn something new, you'd be given a PDA entry that your character wrote so you could refer back to it later. Maybe there would be a little bit of story, like aliens or something really unique about the planet, but I can't really imagine there being anything big except for an obtainable ending. This idea for a game kind of reminds me of a couple of other ones I've played. The multiplayer ocean survival aspect reminds me of Raft, except in this game, you'd be underwater most of the time and would start out in a submarine. Barrow Trauma is also a decent comparison, except the goal of the game wouldn't be to complete missions, it would just be to survive and explore. I definitely see a whole lot of potential for this game, but there are still loads of details that would need to be worked out, more than any other concept so far. I think the hardest part would be designing the massive map. It would likely take an extended period of time, and Unknown Worlds would have to come up with a lot of unique and new ideas. But in the end, I think it would be worth it and would deliver us another amazing game in the Subnautica universe. Once again, please let me know what you think about these ideas in the comment section down below. Let me know if you have any suggestions, think anything should be changed, or have any different ideas for a third Subnautica game. And I'll see you guys in the next video.